Unfortunately, much of that information was lost as it was taken from them so that there would be no evidence that there were positive findings. We know in General Schwarzkopf's logs, his own personal CENTCOM logs, there is evidence there and we have copies of three of those showing that there were in fact chemicals in the battlefield area. The M8A1 alarm system will not only be one of the most reliable and effective warning devices in the field, its warning could well be what saves your life. It would certainly be a major international embarrassment that our soldiers became sick and died because of weapons we had sold to Saddam Hussein. So rather than acknowledging the thousands of chemical alarms that went off during the Persian Gulf War were real, they had to say that not a single alarm was real. We were told by the White House, the Pentagon, the Defense Department, the Veterans Administration, the Gulf War Syndrome is merely post-traumatic stress syndrome. And therefore, we can't be treating them for all these diseases they manifest because it's all in their mind. The Department of Defense, the CIA, the Veterans Administration, and the White House all had to conspire together to withhold this information. To keep the public from understanding that there was a real illness, Gulf War illness, they utilized places like Rand Corporation or they utilized uh, the Institute of Medicine, NIH. They would get these agencies to issue reports that, well, we can't figure it out, we don't see any problem here, and therefore they must be fine. It's by giving an independent, alleged, third party the information and letting them to decide that there is no problem and then the VA cannot treat for anything that does not exist. Most of the troops that placed Gulf War illness on their compensation or disability paperwork were turned down immediately. Stress alone can produce a lot of the symptoms that we're, uh, the vets are having, and that doesn't mean that it's imaginary in their head. It's stress having a physiological and physical effect on their body. Dr. Michael Kilpatrick of the Department of Defense insists that stress is still a factor in the veterans' illnesses. We still don't have a test that says, yes, this exposure causes this brain damage. Then we got reports how many of them had gone forward to the medics and complained about being sick during the war, and yet none of those records were available. So all of those records were sanitized. In fact, I even got a memo that all information regarding those who had been in for treatment or attempted to get some treatment during the Gulf War, those records should be removed. After the first uh, Gulf War conflict uh, in 1991, uh, the government, particularly the VA, was uh, pushing the diagnosis of post-traumatic uh, stress disorder uh, for Armed Forces personnel that were becoming sick. At the time, we, we knew that this couldn't be the, the reason uh, because of the multiple signs and symptoms that are totally unrelated to post-traumatic stress disorder. Also, many of the medical problems, not psychological problems, that these Gulf War veterans had, so we, we knew it didn't fit. I don't think you can possibly pass off the fact that a soldier has a deformed child to post-traumatic stress. Whether you believe in post-traumatic stress or not, and I'm not sure, I'm not a scientist, but someone getting Hodgkiss disease, kidney failure, or having their children born with no limbs uh, cannot possibly be viewed as a psychological problem. And they actively participated in the character assassination of people, even in front of Congress, in testimony. Uh, Dr. Bernard Rosker would character assassinate anyone who said that veterans were ill for anything other than stress. We are dedicated to trying to get at the bottom of why so many of our Gulf War veterans are ill today. We need much more candor from the DOD and the VA and the CIA. This may sound a bit harsh, but some heads need to roll. Because I really believe that all three, to various degrees, have participated in a cover-up. We're at that point now where it's almost criminal uh, the lack of cooperation we've received from various government agencies. Clearly something happened. And to see, in essence, the stonewalling by both the CIA as well as the Pentagon, uh, we can't let them just put the, sweep this thing under the rug. At the end of my career in the military, 
in this office, I had the opportunity to get promoted, and I was so disturbed that 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 my legacy had been that I had served in special forces units and ranger operations, and everybody thought I was the best thing since sliced bread. But then I get into this unit, and it's 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 designed to screw over the veteran, and that was the last place that I worked. And, and I was so disturbed that I didn't want them, I didn't want them to touch the rank that I was going to receive and pin it on my shoulders because they weren't, the, some of the people there were not honorable people. The leaders at the top of this organization, they purposely set out to manipulate science and to steer science away from looking at the real exposures. Is there any indication now that the Department of Defense is taking this seriously? There are a number of documents that prove that the Department of Defense failed to disclose the truth about what happened during the Gulf War. They know what's going on, but they don't want the American public to know what's happening. Senator Don Regal made a statement in one of the Senate reports that states, yes, there's a mental problem, all right, but it's over at the Department of Defense. The chemical weapons were seen at Canisea. They knew full well the countries that had transferred these biological and chemical agents. Our troops saw them over there. They knew the coloration of those weapons. They identified those weapons. And yet you have General Schwarzkopf and Powell doing everything they can to cover up the information that would have saved the lives of many of these troops. My fellow citizens, events in Iraq have now reached the final days of decision. Intelligence gathered by this and other governments leaves no doubt that the Iraqi regime continues to possess and conceal some of the most lethal weapons ever devised. No act of theirs can alter the course or shake the resolve of this country. We are a peaceful people. today from our testing that uranium dust and oxide is transferred extensively throughout the environment. It will contaminate air, water, and soil. And most specifically, as stated in the U.S. Army's own common task training for response to uranium munitions use, it will contaminate food and water. One of the significant warnings that came about in a Pentagon briefing prior to Gulf War II was issued by U.S. Army Colonel J. Edgar Wakiyama in a briefing to the Pentagon. In there, he identified all the serious adverse health effects, but one of the concerns that they expressed immediately was that children playing in these contaminated environments throughout Iraq or any other areas was used in Afghanistan, also into the Balkans, and now in Somalia, and also into Lebanon, would be exposed to inhalation, ingestion, and absorption, and therefore we would see significant adverse health effects within the child and the children population. I think it was 2002, I gave evidence to the, uh, Congre the U.S. Congressional Committee on Veterans Affairs. They came to London, to the House of Lords, to take evidence on, on the health effects of depleted uranium. And they were quite impressed at the time, and they said that they were certainly ensure that this would be published. But in fact, I never heard any more from this, so I imagine that somebody squashed it at some point down the line. We've taken our cameras into Iraq. Let's show you the impact of depleted uranium on the children, on the pregnant women, on virtually all the citizens of Iraq who have to breathe it in every single day. <laughs> 